My name is Corey Philippeck Ogden and I'm a PhD student here in the Department of Archaeology at Durham University. My research interest in this department is looking at leprosy at both the biological and social levels in medieval England. We have these concepts, these preconceived notions about leprosy, as that it was a very stigmatizing disease. And while there are some sources that do indicate that, the archaeological record isn't really reflecting it. I'm using stable isotope analyses to look at where these people that are buried with leprosy were coming from. And I'm also looking at a method called incremental dentine, which will give me their entire life history and physiology, something that has never been accessed before. By looking at the mobility of where people were coming from, we can start to gain a better picture of how, what kind of distances people were traveling for care and treatment. We can also look at how people were buried within cemeteries and what distances they were traveling if they had leprosy. So we're looking at different patterns of dissemination, but we're also looking at social stigma in that respect. There's a new method in stable isotope analyses right now that was pioneered by Julia Beaumont from Bradford and Janet Montgomery from this university called incremental dentine analyses. And effectively what we can do is we can section a tooth that gives us year by year of the individual's life up until the tooth is done forming. So for my research I'm targeting non-adults or people that died before their teeth were done forming so I can see every single year of their life. By looking at this I can see physiological stressors and see how long they may have had the disease and exactly when the disease started to take hold of the body to cause death. Leprosy affects the peripheral nervous system and causes things like skin lesions. Now for most people that will spontaneously resolve. They'll have no real symptoms, but for a very small fraction of people, some very disfiguring and disabling effects can take place. In the skeleton we, send, we tend to see it in the facial region as well as the hands and feet. So what we can see on the skeletons that I'm using are very destructive lesions in the facial region as well as destructive lesions in the hands and feet and sometimes even legs. Now all of these are very characteristic of the way that leprosy affects the skeleton. We know how leprosy affects the skeleton due to a clinician from Denmark in the 60s that excavated a cemetery and actually used archaeological remains to teach doctors what leprosy does to the skeleton. Some of the skeletal indicators of leprosy that we can see in the facial region, um, one, are this kind of build up a bone around the nose, and this would have been to support a collapsed nose. And then if we turn the maxilla to the side, so this would have been in the profile view, we can see the difference that uh, this region, which is called the anterior nasal spine, has been resorbed. Whereas on this individual, it's normal, so it should come out a bit, whereas this has been resorbed in. This resorption of the anterior nasal spine and this buildup of bone would have resulted probably in a nasal collapse. And then if we look on the, in, on the superior part of the hard palate, we can see a bony reaction. So we, all of this is in reaction to the leprosy, kind of, or the bone responding to the bacterium. Leprosy, like any infectious disease, relies upon some form of contact. Now it's a very slow pathogen, so some people can have leprosy for up to 20 years and not even know it, and never develop any signs or symptoms. But for some people, after five years, it might start with a skin lesion, a skin rash, paralysis in the hands, and then just continue on from there. But that only affects very few people. Leprosy is caused by a bacterium called Mycobacterium leprae. It's one of the oldest pathogens in existence. The period of interest I'm looking at is in medieval England, and I'm working on two sites. One is the Winchester St. Mary Magdalene Leprosy Hospital, and another one is uh, St. John Timberhill, which was a parish cemetery site in Norwich. And that cemetery has the most amount of people with leprosy that wasn't associated directly with the leprosaria. In the Winchester site, some of the radiocarbon dates have come back to actually pre-Norman conquest and just around that time period, whereas the St. John Timberhill site is 12th to 14th century. Historical sources about leprosy and leprosaria from the medieval period are very differing. Um, Carol Rawcliffe has really led the field in some of these analyses and compiling these historic records. So we've got some sources coming from the continent that are do claim to be treating peoples with leprosy as outcasts. 
And then we've got some sources from England saying that they were almost venerated for their suffering, almost akin to the passion of the Christ, and that they're being given beer and bread, beds, blankets every single day, which I mean, sounds pretty nice, even for a PhD student. <laughs> when we think about leprosy in medieval England or medieval Europe in general, it's, it's really difficult because since this main symptom of leprosy is skin lesions, I mean, doctors now have a hard time diagnosing a variety of skin conditions, let alone a thousand years ago. So acne could have been diagnosed as leprosy or rosacea or, um, chicken pox. We don't know what would have been uh, considered leprous at the time. Uh, however, we do know, especially at the Winchester Hospital, that they were diagnosing leprosy fairly accurately because the number of people that were buried there that have the skeletal indicators of leprosy is astonishing. Leprosaria historically are leprosy hospitals. Uh, when we read some of these sources, from, especially from the 18th and 19th centuries, they're described as these kind of uh, facilities on the edges of town that people are ostracized to or exiled to and then uncared for. But when we start to actually look back at some of the few historical sources we have from these times, some of the records indicate quite the opposite. So really, we're trying to look at the archaeological evidence and combine this to test it against some of the historical evidence. So one of the primary reasons I'm doing this research is the modern day implications. So a lot of places where leprosy is still endemic, places like India, Brazil, they use these um, 18th and 19th century historical sources about leprosy, about it being a stigmatizing or a kind of um, unholy disease, and they use that to stigmatize sufferers today. So by actually going back and looking at the medieval archaeology, we might be able to dispel some of these uh, misconceptions. I think the incremental dentine results are going to be very interesting. This is the first time that this method is being applied to anybody with a disease. So this is the first time that we'll be able to see an individual's life history and physiology year by year of somebody that suffered with an infection. Now this has, again, a lot of modern day implications. Clinicians cannot ethically go back and do that. And while our specialty is imbued with a huge code of ethics, we can, we are able to take some of these remains that are thousands of years old and hopefully help contemporary sufferers.